ました。Oh, I see Elijah there too. I and the Brianna. Board. How about 15? 15? Okay. Let's do 15. <laughs> last Sunday when we had our Sunday school and uh, we have uh, Brother Rob and, and Sister Brenda to blame for this. 
They did such a great Sunday school on Kevin. And um, it had me change my focus this week on heaven. So I'm on a heaven trip. And uh, I'm going to share some of that thought process today a little bit, I think. Um, and, you know, the world's in out of control. I mean, it is out of control. It's not getting there. We're there. And, uh, you know, it's just to the point where you just I get the feeling that there's no hope. For a better day. Now you can listen to the politicians and all those people that are going to govern and and then you know get get things straight for us. And uh, if you can believe them, you know there's hope. But no, can you believe them? I, I don't. I don't think that's possible anymore. Um, you know the politics, uh, personalities, the uh, you know the. The freedoms that that people are seeking in this world, you know, justifies everybody's behavior. You know, it's it's my right, regardless if it disrespects the rights of other people. That's kind of the world we live in today, and uh, it's been predicted. I mean, the scriptures have that all over the place. That you know, we're living in those days now, those times. They've got this thing called the doomsday clock. You maybe have heard about that, right? And, the guys, and I don't understand the theory of that. I don't waste a lot of time trying to understand it. But, you know, the people that are proponents of that thing say that uh, the clock is 90 seconds away from midnight, whatever the heck that means. Like the end of the world, I guess, is what they're trying to say. 90 seconds isn't a long time. So they're saying we're kind of at the brink of that. Well, yeah, we know from our studies of the scripture that things have to happen yet. That's probably longer than 90 seconds to make happen. And we're, we're privileged to have that window of the world, so to speak, you know, just where we're at. We know we're in the midst of the madness, and it's not going to get any better, no matter how you try and listen to people do something like that. So, I don't know about you, but I, I'm ready for unlimited joy and peace and, and calmness in my life. And where are you going to get that? Well, you get that from Jesus while we're here. He's going to help us sustain, but... The long lasting peace and joy that we're going to get is not here, it's in heaven. You know? And, and there's scripture that tells us that. If we could just hang on, you know, things are going to get better for us in the next world. But there's stuff that we've got to go through here and now uh, that we've got to just deal with. And it doesn't make any difference if we're righteous and the Lord, Lord loves us or whatever. Uh, we're still going to go through things. We're in the world, but not of the world. What the scripture tells us. So we suffer along with everybody else. Yesterday's snowstorm. We were in that with everybody, right? Nobody got spared from that mess yesterday. In that regard, and then a lot of other things happen in our lives. But you know, as we contemplate heaven, which none of us really understand or know, we got a lot of questions. You know, you've got your own questions. I've got some of mine. Like, uh, will these aches and pains and problems here on Earth still be there? So, hypothetically, if a little boy dies at three years old, and an old man dies at 104, is a little boy a toddler in heaven? And is the old man still an old man? Or do they take on some other form in some other way? It doesn't make any difference, but it's things that you think about. Am I going to be in heaven like I am today? Or not? Some other things. Are there going to be diapers? <laughs> Is there going to be baseball? How about warriors? Are they going to be there? Or TV? Is that going to be in heaven? We don't know. We don't know. Revelations, 21st chapter. John had some insight. He had some insight that allows us to figure some of this stuff out, or at least maybe start to answer some of these crazy questions we got. And I can't see it. But this is a cool little thing. If any of you need glasses, you can get us this, this phone case that comes back. And we can have a look at the results. And they don't look too cool. But they're functional. Okay. No, they don't? Okay. John 
It says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, <clears throat> prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It says, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now we get to the point. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he sat upon the throne and said, Behold, I make all things new. <laughs> Changing our focus while we're in the crazy world that we're in gives us some hope with what John was had the privilege to see. There's a new heaven and a new earth. Not not, not what we've got custom to know as, as our life around us, but there's a newness to things where, you know, there's going to still be questions today. You know, am I going to be fat in heaven? <clears throat> Will it be hamburgers and tacos and stuff like that? I got some questions. How about diabetes and heart trouble? Will that be there? Yeah. Talks about uh, who will be there? Who will be in Well, our friends and family. Relationships. Will relationships be the same in heaven as in them for these two? No. Um, I think it's a thought process that we should have, and I think that we ought to kind of like prepare ourselves that that relationships might be different than we know them to be here, but at the same time, they're going to be glorious. There'll be a unity of our spirits that we've never known here on earth. One thing we can know about relationships is that God himself will be there. And Jesus Christ said, right, I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. So we know he's there. So with God and Jesus in that environment, I, I don't know what form our relationships are going to take with each other. But you know what? With those two there, we're going to enjoy it. It's going to be a different realm. And we can do a little practice while we're here for that time with each other in the forms that we have. It gives us something to do. Like, like Jesus said, occupy until I come. You know, uh, I think we need to occupy our, 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 our vision of what the next life's going to be. Well, where well, well, he says it, right? There's not going to be any We'll see it yeah, I'm going to need these in heaven. <laughs> we wipe away all the tears from our eyes, and no more death, and neither sorrow nor crying shall be there any more pain. Amen. Now, we don't have that necessarily right now. We're going through that. Sister Joyce is going through some, some real issues and aggravations. Brother Chuck, you know, is, is having his trouble, and so is Joan in that situation. So is Carrie. In her situation at all, you know, uh, and that's what we have to live with here. But as we have that hope and focus as to when this life ends, and it will end for all of us. Remember what I tell you guys from time to time, right? When it's your time, it's your time, and we all have a time, and we all have a time of purpose, as Ecclesiastes says, right? There's a time of purpose for all things that are ahead, and we need to occupy our time in ways that make us think better and feel better while we have to endure the life that we have. And, and sometimes, and for most cases for us, we're having struggles, and we're having trials and tribulations that uh, uh, are not comfortable to go through, but when you look around the world today and you think about people in Gaza, and you think about people in downtown Denver on the street, and you think about these poor people from Venezuela who are so desperate to get out of there, to get to living on the streets in Denver. That's a better life for them. Goodness sake. We have it good. In spite of what 
we have to go through or something like that. So putting things in perspective. Because we have the Lord in our life, we have hope today. You know, we know that the Lord, you know, through his anointing, is in the prayers, in his time, with his will, to get us through these trials and tribulations that we have in our life. And he has. Every single one of us has had trials and tribulations and some grief and disasters to deal with in our life. But we're here, and we'll hear a little bit shorter, the testimonies of how the Lord has come into your life and blessed you while in this life, while we prepare for this condition in this situation that John was able to see. For an eternity. And that's a whole other subject about how long that is. And, and how can we understand that? Sometimes it's an eternity, right? When we're driving up to the mountains to go skiing on a, on a Friday night. That's an eternity to get up there. And coming back on Sunday. Eternities. Go on Wednesday is what Stephanie said. <laughs> it's easier. Yeah, relationships in heaven. Jesus is going to be there. He's going to walk and he's going to talk with us. He's going to put his arm around us. And, and those of us who have become the chosen fans on that video thing, right? You see Jesus in a personified way, like he's one of us, where he laughs with you and jokes with you and has fun, you know? And that's what's going to be in heaven. He's going to walk with us and talk with us. He's going to put an arm around us. He's going to be the friend that we read about in the scriptures. He's going to be there with us. He's going to touch us physically. And we're going to be able to hug him physically. And that's going to give us some insurmountable peace and joy in our life. We can't even comprehend that. But we got to stay the course while we're here. we got to deal with things in this life. That's the reality of who we are. There's a, a producer of a TV show, a guy named Norman Lear, and I think I've said this before. He, he produced uh, All in the Family and the Jeffersons and all those sitcoms from many years ago, right? And he just recently passed away, but before he passed away, somebody asked him about, you know, dying. He went to the place else. He said, well, he says, it's not the going that disturbs me, because I know where I'm going. He says, it's the leaving that bothers me. The fact that, you know, all that we know in this life, sometimes as miserable as it can be, is all that we've got. Our family, our friends, you know, and, and the blessings that the Lord has given us. Uh, leaving that's tough. But we need to start changing our focus. We need to start talking about going and where it is that we're going. Because sooner or later, all that we leave in this life and all of our connections and family and friends and whatever we know, they're going to go too. And if we live the right kind of life, and if they can leave the right kind of life, you know what? We're going to have a new kind of life that lasts forever. Who's going to be in heaven? The forgiven sinners are going to be there. Those that have dedicated their lives to the gospel of Jesus Christ and have have, have witnessed the people that have had changed souls or commissioned themselves to go to God-forsaken places in this earth to help support people and to give them an, an idea of what life could be like if they had Christ in life. They're going to definitely be there. The guy or gal who in their last breath says, remember me, is going to be there. You know that guy that was hanging by the cross, Jesus on the cross? In the last moments of his life, he recognized who Jesus was. And what did Jesus tell him? This day, you will be in paradise. Those people are going to be there. So we all have chance. We, we should not just delay that opportunity until that moment. Because, again, we do not know when that moment's going to come. So we have some preparation to do here. Now, we've got to be able to... Uh, <laughs> kind of get ourselves together and uh, understand what we have to do to be clean enough, to be righteous enough, to be in the realm, to be accepted into that kingdom that John saw. And what's that environment like? What's the closest thing we get to it while we're in this life? 
I'm going to throw a camp out. How do you feel at camp out? You don't think about your job. You don't think about your illness or whatever. You think about rejoicing and fellowship with the people that you love that God's put together because of his son, Jesus Christ. And it's hard to leave that week. When it's time to clean out the cabins and pack up the car and go again, you know, we procrastinate because we got to come back to this, you know, and it's back to the same old brain again. And how long does it take us to keep that camp out sphere? Probably before next Sunday, we don't have it anymore in most cases. If you're like me, you know, unfortunately, you, you, you occupy. We do too much occupying sometimes. And we kind of drift away from the feelings that we need to have while we can have a, a, a bit of heaven on our Sundays. Yeah, we're a small little group and we're blessed to have visitors. We're hungry for visitors in that regard. We have Zoom. We have Texas and, and we have Canada. And we sometimes or most of the time we have Omaha, Nebraska on it. And we have Pennsylvania on it right there. You know, and we have a closeness. That may not be quite as good as camp out, but you know, for at least two hours a week, I you know we have a moment where we have some peace that passes understanding and a little bit of joy because we're rejoicing together with Jesus Christ and in his name. God's going to wipe away the tears, he says. And sometimes there's too many tears. And not to any fault of our own, but it's life that comes upon us. We saw a, a movie. We were all snowed in yesterday, so we didn't have a chance to get to do much. And, and uh, I want to say, though, that the side yard at my house has never been <laughs> shoveled as cleanly as Elijah did yesterday. The young man was itching to get out there and do something in the snow. So we don't snowboard here. We shovel. <laughs> and, and he shoveled this six inches of wet, slushy snow. And I was watching him. You know, he didn't listen to what I said. Push it. He lifted it. But he's young. He's got a good, strong back. Yeah. You know, we've got to go through things like that in our life to occupy our time. But it was was an opportunity, again, uh, he gave us a blessing. He gave me a blessing mm -hmm. just for that because I didn't have to do it. Right. You know? I had no pain and no, no, no suffering yesterday because he did it for me, which was nice. Mm -hmm. Heaven. No hospitals, nurses, I'm sorry. You're unemployed in heaven. No prisons. My son-in-law, the Denver cop, is going to have to put his gun away because it's not going to be necessary there. And the people who run cemeteries, they're out of business because there's no graveyards there. No pain, no death. No suffering or something like that. There's no violence there. No betrayals. No politicians telling you what they want to tell you in that regard. No scorecards. We're not keeping pace with one another up there at all. It's all one and the same. It's an all level playing field. You know? No Alzheimer's. No diabetes. I don't need my pump there anymore. No pancreatitis, no cancer, twice, none of that's there as you endure through what you have to do this week. No Parkinson's, no heart problems, none of that stuff. It's also a place that we don't relive our past. And I don't know about you, but I, I kind of tend to hang on to that every now and then. Because in, in, in my life, you know, I've made decisions that have impacted my family that probably were not the best decisions for our family. Leaving Ohio so many years ago to go to San Francisco, that was a great career. It didn't too much for my kids knowing the relationship with their grandparents and their uncles and their aunts, but we took them all away from them. And they grew up having that that ability to be loved and hugged by people who love them from a distance. And we, we, we left California to come here 31 years ago. Great career move again. 
you know, but I wrecked two of my kids' lives because, you know, uh, I took them away from a, a safe network of friends and family and activities to come out here. I want to say for nothing, because in 31 years, and we've talked about that. What was the point? You know, I, I was in an Anaheim branch where everything was just wonderful. Brianna knows that. The people that we love who still love us. But time and distance has taken its toll. We're talking yesterday, Grandpa Joe's 86. What the heck happened? <laughs> you know, how fast did that go? So sometimes, you know, when I can't get to sleep, instead of counting sheep, I count the mistakes I've made in my past, like moving my family. And have them grow up with, in, in, in the second case, the first case, they didn't grow up with their family, their grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles. In the second case, our extended family, the brothers and sisters that became our family. From San Diego to Manifesto. They're 86 years now. Some of them are gone. In fact, during Christmas week, we lost seven people, either family or church brothers and sisters over the course of two weeks. God bless them. They're in this place that I'm talking about today. They don't have any sickness and pain, any trouble, trials or tribulations. They don't have to listen to politicians trying to become president and all that nonsense that goes on in life today. They have this peace that passes understanding, this, this ultimate joy that we hope to have. But Sometimes, instead of counting sheep at night, I count my mistakes, and I try to do them over and say, well, if, if I had 40 years back again, how would I approach this thing? A job? Forget it. That, that should not be the basis of how I live my life, my family. What's best for them? You know, I can get a dumb job any place, any time. I could have. I don't want to anymore. I don't need to anymore. But then, you know, that was the priority. And as I occupy my time, you make decisions in life that are contrary to perhaps what's best for you spiritually, what's best for your family spiritually. Yeah, I got a son that's baptized. He got baptized at a camp out in Oakland in California. But those days are done. After the third marriage, he was finished with all that stuff. I don't criticize him for that. I blame myself because they took him out of the environment that he could have been nurtured. And yeah, you know what? Even though you're in the environment, you know, kids still leave the church. They've seen that in Irvine. They see that in Mesa. They've seen it in all the cases. Even though, you know, the apostles of the church kid, kids did not stick around in anything like that. You know, they're gone too. So, so technically, even though I try to redo my life and say, well, okay, maybe in heaven... I get a duel. Maybe in heaven I get to practice what I screwed up in this life, and I can go up there in heaven and make it happen. But you know, that doesn't count anymore. Because this life doesn't matter when we get to that life. No matter what we successfully achieved in this life doesn't matter, and what we pitifully fail in in life doesn't matter. And you know why? There's God sitting on his throne and we're right there. And Jesus is at that right hand with his arm around us and saying, let me take you to your mansion that I built for you. Because this is a whole new world for you. And an opportunity for you to just forget about all that stuff. And enjoy what you've worked for on this earth to be spent in an eternity with all those that have gone before us, all these people, my friends, my family, and all that, that are gone now, they're gone. But I normally you know later, you know, they don't fear going because it's a joyous occasion. And maybe for a moment they feared leaving us, but that was soon forgotten in a different realm with a different relationship that they have with each other and particularly with the Lord and all that, man. You know, um, there's this guy, Michael Finley, who wrote a song a couple of years ago, and there's a movie about it, too, called Imagine. I can only imagine. Listen to that song sometimes. And think about it in the realm of, can you imagine? 
Mm -hmm. Can you imagine where we're going and what it's going to be like? This is beautiful. We got to, we, we can't, we can't continue to put heaven in a box and, and, and bring it out every now and then when we have a desperate need to think about something better in our life. No, we need to have it out there in our lives all the time. We've got to practice heaven in our life, even though around us it's a hell in many occasions. Sometimes we live in hell on earth. No fault of our own in anything like this. Things happen. But you know what? That's not what our focus needs to be. Our focus needs to be on that place that John saw where there's no death and no pain and no sorrow anymore. Where it's nothing but joy and singing and the delight of, of being with uh, our family and those that we don't even know. But we're going to know them and, and be as close to them as those that we do love and know on this earth today. Because God's there. Because Jesus is there. And, and, and he's here. He's amongst us all the time. It's just harder to see him. There's too much stuff that gets in the way between us and our vision of Jesus in our lives. We saw a movie. I was going back to that again. What was the name of that thing? The girl in the whatever. Remember the one with the little girl that was the movie? Yeah. Yeah. It was a Netflix thing that we saw yesterday about this little girl who the Lord blessed with the gift of being able to heal people. But there was a condition that, you know, she can do what the Lord wanted her to do on this earth, but soon she was going to be with. And and that was a difficult thing to deal with. But not that little girl. That little girl was focused on doing what the Lord told her to do. And the fact that she was going to be with him. Kid was maybe nine or ten. I don't know. She hadn't spirit life yet, as we've known it. But that didn't matter to her. Because she was going to be there with God. And, and that was her passion and commitment. Jesus tells us that we need to be like little children. Not as complicated as we make life to be. Be, be simple. Be focused. Be joyous in the fact that, that God wants us do his will in our life, we need to start paying attention a little bit more to what that will was, like that little girl did. I mean, I mean, she was a square peg in a round hole, you know, and 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 it, it brought some grief to the family, but joy in the end when they reconciled the fact that she was going to be in this place where she was going to be well forever. Revelation. 21.5 says, And he that sat upon the throne says, Behold, I make all things new. The John writes, All things new. It's like getting up in the morning, you know, it's a new day. Yesterday was fresh, you know. I got to get out of the funk that we had from yesterday to today. So if we begin to get up every day, you know, in, in Alma, we talk about this a lot, right? The Lord says that, that we should, before we go to bed at night, we should we should thank the Lord for the day that we had and put our head on the pillow and thank him for a good night's rest so that when we wake up in the morning, we can start fresh. We can start a new, a new day. It's a new day in heaven every day. It's God said he makes it. He can make a new for us here while we're getting to get to that point. Green. Maybe, maybe that's the essence of what I'm trying to say today while we contemplate and get our hands around this concept of heaven. We have still all these questions about is this going to be there, is that going to be there, whatever, whatever. You know, I, I think that's good to occupy our thought process because it focuses on being there. <laughs> but I think we just ought to dream about heaven. Me, instead of kind of having insomnia at night and trying to figure out how can I do my life over again for all the mistakes I made, maybe I need to change my focus and say, you know what? I'm going to think about what the heck heaven's like. What's it all about? If I can keep that focus a little bit, even though I'm afflicted and even though I have car accidents and, and, and stuff like that, you know, uh, it kind of gets me through. 
And that's the point I'm trying to say today. We, we need to get through this life to make sure that we're worthy enough and accepting enough, you know, that we can get there. Well, not everybody gets there. We have to be accountable for the choices we make in life. And I guess as you get older, you become more accountable because you're closer to maybe that moment, you know, where uh, your probationary time is done. Now it's time to be accountable for it. And I have to explain what I've done in life. So dream is what I'm saying. Dream about that concept of heaven and how there is no pain and suffering and death and whatever. And, and, and at the same time as we dream, you know, we need to commit ourselves that, that, that we can kind of live the life that, that God expects us to live. I mean, we send Jesus down here to live a complicated life and be able to know what it's going to take to get through it all. And he did, he did everything, including sacrificing his life for our soul salvation that if we but believe in who Jesus was and what his gospel was about. If we focus on that and, 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 and humble ourselves that, that when we mess up in life, and we will, that the Lord says that he will forgive us of our sins. But the fact of the matter is we just don't sin and forget it, but we sin and we our humility says, you know what, Lord, I'm not going to try to do that again. And with your will, I can get through it all. Dream, leave. This whole concept of heaven. You know, Helaman, he writes, third chapter of Helaman, the 20th verse, he says, Yea, thus we see that the gate of heaven is open unto all, even unto those who will believe on the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it's open to all if you love believing. But old King Benjamin, we keep coming back to him week after week. Because that guy has that insight on the simpler things in life that allow us to, to keep pace with this life to be able to make it. Simple, not confusing. He says in very simple words, believe in God. Believe that he is and that he created all things, both in heaven and in earth. Believe that he has all wisdom and all power, both in heaven and in earth. Believe that man does, comp does not comprehend the things which the Lord can comprehend. Okay, so we struggle with, is this going to be in heaven, not going to be in heaven, whatever. That's the natural feeling of the natural man. And we can't comprehend at all what God's got prepared for us in heaven. So uh, I'm just going to close with that. Stay focused. Dream about heaven. Contemplate the concept that's there that, again, we're saying, that, like uh, King Benjamin said, we're not, we're not going to fully comprehend it. You know, but if we, so our mind is stayed on that, right? If our mind is stayed on Jesus Christ, right? All things work together for good and things. So as we kind of pace ourselves in this life, kind of deal with what it is with all these talking heads and all this aggravation that's around us all the time, you know, Read the 21st chapter of Revelations again and what John saw. That it can help me maybe make it put it in focus a little bit more about where we're coming. So, sorry that took longer than I expected, but Brenda and Rob, I've been you guys for talking about heaven last Sunday in Sunday school. Because it motivated me to kind of think about that a little bit more myself. So, that's what I'm going to do. And I'll challenge you for what you have to do to keep that concept alive while we occupy it. Well, I don't want to say much. I just wanted to, if I could, layer something on top of Walt's words this morning. You know, we're, we're excited to be here today. We started off in a prayer service, and we've been praying for uh, Teacher Joyce. A lot this week, and um, praying for a free in your life that uh, the Lord would bless them with uh, direction and open doors, whatever next phase they have in life. And just for the needs of the church and Denver Mission, we have a 
a full house here today. Of course, we only have about a few more <laughs> chairs, but that's just a minor detail. Um, Amen. So we're excited to have any visitors uh, we can get. <laughs> and, um, you know, Walt was asking us what we think will be or not be. What would maybe be missing? Yeah. And, uh, I always ask why not. Do you think there's going to be snow in time? <laughs> so how are we going to stop? stop work, yeah. uh, I don't know. But, you know, it's funny. This week, <laughs> as I was thinking, and we often do this. It doesn't matter whether Walt's been open, I'm going to open. We're always thinking about the message. And then Sunday comes and we have the same thought. The, 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 the word that was in my heart since yesterday morning is expectation which I think is very much the same thing as hope. And I thought about expectation at first as a negative, because, um, and maybe this is the question first, is it a good thing or a bad thing to have expectation? Um, often others expect things of you, or you expect things of others, and that leads to heartache. And Walt, I think, shared from you know, so with depth of heart today some things that, you know, we all have those things, don't we? That we regret in life, or we think, I really wish I could go back and, and redo that. And, um, but I think when one's heart is in that, that mode, you don't have to. I don't think you have to go back and redo it. Because that's the whole point of the gospel, in large part, that we could repent and that we could uh, exercise, you know, this new effort, newfound effort to, to do right from here. And we convey that in love and we, we apologize or we repent and we, we, we move forward. Thank God we can move forward. And I love that idea that in the kingdom of heaven, we're not going to relive the past because God sets us free from that. Praise the Lord, because if there were no clean slates available to us, I don't know how I'd move forward. But um, expectation can be a, a tough thing. I'll tell you, I go to work and the expectation uh, this week was stressful. And I thought, you know, I just <laughs> speaking of jobs, I don't know how much more of this I can take. <laughs> and, um, you know, Stress or disappointment from expectation, and it's not fun, not a fun feeling, it's not fun to be disappointed, it's not fun to feel you disappointed someone. <laughs> and I thought, you know, well, what's the healthy perspective or the positive side of expectation? And I think it's this that we can shift our focus away from the expectations of people. On to the expectations of the Lord. Because, you know, God has an aim for us in our lives. And if we, if we make that our aim, instead of pleasing people or being pleased by people, I think we'll be a lot happier. Because God has grace and uh, helps us along the way. And I think that when we set our sights on him, he... For one thing, we won't go wrong. That's always a worthy aim. If we have a worthy aim in life, that means we have a purpose that's deep enough to pull us through trials. And that's a big deal in life. And not only does God say, here, I've got the perfect aim for you. If you'll accept it and set your sights on it, It'll be enough to get you through. It'll be a worthy aim. I'm not sure that's the case with people's expectations because sometimes you go through all the work to make them happy, and then what do you have? The people are flighty. You know, you could do all that you can to try to please someone, and then speaking of relationships, it doesn't last anyone. And people let you down. But we have a way to overcome all of that in the church. So God has a worthy aim, and God helps us reach the aim, doesn't he? I think that's beautiful, too. You know, that it's also unique from perhaps the, the expectations of people. And so it's, I, I think this message today is that um, 
has come out. And I think it ties in too with uh, uh, with Elijah's words this morning, you know, to share and build. You know, that's a beautiful thought because we have a purpose and much of it is that. That should be the expectation and the aim that we set for ourselves that we would receive the, the glories of God and then have a, a desire for a compassionate place in our hearts to share it with others. To build in the kingdom of God. What could be better than that? And so if we move ourselves away from the expectations of the world and all the disappointments that come from that, we put that aside and align ourselves instead with God's expectations. I think, one, we free ourselves from all that disappointment and stress that comes from the ways of the world. Uh, two, we end up finding that um, if we just do things God's way, we'll be satisfied. I think we're looking for that in life. We hunger for it. And the things of this world never bring it. Though they promise it, they'll come. And so we find satisfaction in the Lord's path. And I think we actually become more acceptable in the eyes of others anyway. Right? Because when you set God first in your life and you do it his way, it's, it's, it's attractive, honorable. Others look at you probably better than they would have if you had tried to displease them because, let's be honest, we don't know what we want half the time. I think I know what I want of you, and then you give it to me, and I think, oh, no, no, I want something else. It just never ends with us, right? We're, again, we're a fickle bunch. <laughs> um, and so, you know, a lot comes, I think, from, from doing things God's way, and I just wanted to share a couple scriptures. This first one is from Hebrews 7, 19th verse, and it says, for the law made nothing perfect but the bringing in of a better hope here by the which we draw an eye to God a better hope moving your hope and expectations from the things of the world to a better hope things of God that's what brings about fulfillment and in the prior chapter Hebrews 6 starting in the 17th verse he says this we're in God willing more abundantly to shew unto the, the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by a note. Now, those are some fancy words from Paul. But I think what he's saying here is, the Lord really went out of his way to prove a point. They simply put. And the point was this, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation. Oh, I love that. I want to walk through life that way. Not with fear, not with regret, not with pain, and burdens, and sorrows, but rather a strong consolation. Who has fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. This kingdom of heaven that walked in. Um, that Rob and Brenda were teaching us about last week that we would lay hold upon the hope of that. And I, I thought it was beautiful how well it put it, that an analogy of what I'm leaving and what I'm going towards. And it's hard to leave all that you know, and yet we have to take that leap of faith to understand that what we're gaining is more than we're ever going to lose. That, you know, the kingdom is so much better, right? So once we get there, wrap our arms around it. Well, then I think in a sudden moment, all the anxiety we might have about leaving this life behind, surely that'll just disappear. It'll become a fleeting thing. We'll never regret in the kingdom of heaven that we chose God and that we left this life behind. So he says finally, um, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. This is the anchor that brings us through this life, that we might be able to have a, a, a big enough purpose to pursue. It's, it's worthy of all the burdens of this world. It's, it's, it's worthwhile. 
That's the song, isn't it? We have a song. We have an anchor. Keeps the song. That fast is short while the billows roll. And it says, you know, on, the, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. And we have uh, another song in the Song of Zion, number 83. He'll take care of me. What does it say? So I am satisfied. Oh, the beauty of that. To open our hearts wide today and fully embrace the things of God that we might have complete and perfect fulfillment. That we might receive that, what did it say? Solid uh, comfort. In other words, that the Lord offers us. That we have a purpose worthwhile and, you know, you can try to please the, the world, you can try to please others, you can try to be pleased by others. But what we're learning today, I think, is that if we seek only to please people, that we really don't have a great expectation. But if we seek to please God, we have a great expectation that we'll be satisfied. And I'll tell you, that's a reliable reward. The Lord will not fail. If we could, if we could, you know, I, I agree. When we go to camp, I always say this, oh, if I could just hold on to this, right? If, if Today's the same thing. Hold on to the rod of iron. Hold on to the word of God. Cling on to it, because if we do, I think we can say, <laughs> I'm actually satisfied. I really am. I'm satisfied. In fact, my cup runneth over. Because of the things that God is doing for me in my life, as even uh, a hint of what's to come. And, and you, you get those moments where you, you see and experience, you taste of the glories, and you think, oh, how good, how much better is it going to be there? Um, so thank God bless us to try to endure in these things and realize that no matter how bad this world gets, that day, that moment is coming when it'll be the same thing. It'll be gone, and all will be well with our souls. We may have Well, Jonah's in Kinnah. So somebody else has to be number one.